Hello and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plato, and the fluff on my stylus. It's Dave Vitti. Hello. Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Dave, how are you, mate? I'm all right, thank you very much. How are you? Mm, good, looking forward to this. You're looking, you're looking very smart in the hair department. I like the way you've, you've combed it back <laughs> and you look, you look slick. Uh, do you know what? I just got caught outside in the rain about 10 minutes oh, did you? ago. That's all it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. you look slick. It suits you. And, and I'm there glad no that you've... back. I'm glad that you've made an effort because today is a special day and obviously our guest, I'm sure, will appreciate the, uh, the effort and the style that you've gone to. Well, let's find out. And it is a special day because our guest today is a legend in the world of dance music. A superstar DJ, a record producer, and an actual lawyer. And I mean like a proper one, like mm, a real, real lawyer. Mm. He's the judge that won't budge. It is, of course, the one and only Judge Jules. Hi, Ju- hi Judge. <laughs> hi, Jules. How are you? <laughs> Jules, it's Jules, please. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a while, Jules, since we have seen each other and since we have spoken. How's life? How are you and the family? All good. Yeah, I live this strange dual existence of being a, a, a specialist music lawyer and still a DJ after many decades doing yeah. loads and loads of gigs. Um, not, not necess- I'm fairly confident, actually, there's not anybody else mad enough in the entire world to do the combo of things that I do. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, it is a strange combo, isn't it? Because a lawyer's job ain't an easy job. It's not, it's not like a two days a week job is it mm. no it's I, I i reckon i put in a shift of about 80 hours a week of the two combined yeah for those that don't realize obviously the the judge jules name stems from the fact that you know you you have a, a legal background you presumably sort of parked that for many years obviously when you know the, the djing and, and that career took off at what point did you revert back to sort of incorporating that into your life? I've been doing it about 12 years. I mean, the point I need to make is that I'm a, I'm a music lawyer and I predominantly deal with electronic music. So actually the dif- distinction right. between okay. my two careers is far narrower than it would appear. Right. Um, I, I, yeah. I guess the, the, the thing for me was I hit my sort of early 30s and there weren't that many DJs sort of older than me. Um, I, mm. I guess the key sort of older DJs than me who are still around now would be probably Carl Cox, Paul Oakenfold and Pete Tong. So yeah. there wasn't much of a kind of yeah. career structure to look at and think, well, you know, in 20 years time, will I still be doing this? And um, so I thought mm. I, I, I need to, I need to sort of stay in the music business, use my skill set, dare I say, it, use my brain. So I went back to night school, didn't tell anybody, retrained as a lawyer, uh, assumed that by this point I probably wouldn't be DJing very much. But of course, the, the, the great unknown was the fact that nobody else, including me, actually yeah. wanted to stop going out. So, you know, my market, my market is, yeah, my market is the over 35s now, but there's just a massively mm. buoyant market in over 35 mm. events. I mean, the thought of me when I was, you know, my, when my parents were, when I was a kid, my parents going out with me or them going out to clubs and shaking a leg is like butt clenchingly abhorrent <laughs> as, a, as a concept. But, um, <laughs> but actually, you know, that's, that's, that's what happens now. It's, I think it's, it's a wholly different attitude. Raving is so much part of, mm. so ingrained in people's DNA mm. that they don't simply stop. You get a period when people stop around, probably when they sort of couple up and have kids. Because when you've got very small children, yeah. it's not easy. And, yeah. uh, but then eventually, mm. A, you can't wait to be released again. And B, when you sort of trust yeah. somebody, be it a, a relative or a, or a sitter or anybody else, in fact, to, to look after your kids, you go out again, you think, wow, actually, I, I really miss this. And, that's, and there's a whole ecosystem <laughs> of those sort of events here in the UK but also in other countries all other key countries with kind of big dance music yeah. cultures like down under right. the US to a point mm. um and it's kind of evolved and when I first started doing it it was uh, started doing these older people's gigs it was a case of having to play the kind of records they'd heard first time round but it's it's developed way beyond yeah. that so of course you need some touch points with um, people's youth but at the same time people have the, the crowds I'm playing to anyway and it's sort of week in week out are very open minded now so it's a it's a real you know it, mm. I, I just never anticipated I suppose I suppose in retrospect in the cold light of day it was probably fairly predictable that people would still want to do this so my attempt to yeah, have yeah. to have this kind of cross fade between careers mm. um, to continue my <laughs> DJ metaphor it, it, they both oh, existed that, they're both like now it. still in the mix <laughs> together they're both still in the mix together <laughs> Oh, it's, it's it's just endless, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? It's like it's like a script, and it's not even like that. But it's funny, though, isn't it, Jules? Because it's it's like 
everything you say is like because 50 feels very different now you know when we were when we were kids and when we were sort of in our 20s and whatever 50 seemed ancient you know 50 yeah. was like you know but now it's like as you say you know 50 you kind of thinking well no do you know what people are still lively and young and they want to go out and stuff and you know what you're doing and you know what people like Annie Mack are doing as well with her kind of like raves which finish at midnight you know so that people can get back for their sitters and all this it's a you know it's an interesting market as you say yeah and the irony is actually that um that the younger market the sort of under 30 market all go out much earlier anyway um yeah the, if you were to put a festival on 20 years ago that closed at midnight, you just wouldn't have sold a ticket, literally. But now, yeah. uh, and I know this from having kids who are in their sort of late teens, uh, they they come in before I do. They're, they're all sort of preening in front of the mirror. Mm. They're the sort of love, love the, the, the buffed up Love Island generation <laughs> who couldn't possibly have a late night or get a bit wasted because it might kind of <laughs> dest isn't, destroy the looks for Instagram. Point, isn't that isn't that weird? Yeah. It's, in, it's is, the Instagram, it's yeah. the Instagram and TikTok generation who just—is that what you reckon? Is yeah, that, is that but I tell you is? what, I mean, I yeah, there are one or two bits of YouTube footage for me when I was younger where, in those interviews, I was probably a bit half cut. But thankfully, there's very little mm. evidence, <laughs> of, you know, from that from that era <laughs> to kind of incriminate us. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. now there is just evidence wherever you look. So it is. I, I mean, there are, there are many reasons why. Current generations don't go out as late. There's kind of pool party mm. culture, which emanated, I guess, from uh, Vegas and has become very big in, in uh, Ibiza as well, with um, Ocean yeah. Beach and kind of um, those sort of those sort of venues. But it's it's a really different environment from the way it was before. Mm. So, so Jules, where, where's home now? I mean, is it still Ibiza, or are you backwards and forwards? Or no, I, well, actually, right? I live I live part in London and I live part in Mallorca. Okay. Um, I, okay. I, ah, okay. I yeah, Mallorca is like a more mature take on Ibiza. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ibiza's, Ibiza's mm, yeah. the best place on earth to go out for 48 hours. But actually, yeah, um, yeah. when you hit the winter, is 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 a bit tumbleweed-like. And some people, you know, some residents in Ibiza love that. They love the fact that the tourists have gone home mm, and they can do mm. nothing and they can just hang out drinking a glass of wine with their mates. But I think when you're fundamentally a city person like I am, <clears throat> an island like Mallorca, yeah, which yeah. has got a city, a, a city of five or six hundred thousand people in the shape of Palma de Mallorca, which mm. is like a mini Barcelona. And it's just just never closed yeah. down, closes down. And it's got the kind of creature comforts of of living. All the unglamorous stuff like having an IKEA and having, you know, equivalent to Tesco superstores, <laughs> um, but also shopping yeah. malls like a La Liga football team, all that sort of stuff that yeah. makes it a real really livable place. So I live a bizarre life where I sort mm. of I probably spend a couple of days there a week and then a, the rest of the week in London in my office. And of course, popping up and down the country, DJing as well. Well, that's the thing, you know. And I was I was looking on your website before because, yeah, you know, and it, and it is regular, isn't it? I mean, it's not sort of you know gigs sort of every so often. It's pretty much every weekend you seem to be out going somewhere. It is. I probably do about hundred gigs a year, which is still a bit wow. of a shock to me because that certainly wasn't the way it was planned. I mean, every with every passing year, I or decade, I think no chance will I be doing this in ten years' time, and and roll forward the clock, and here I still am, sort of propping up the decks. Great. Uh, and long may that continue. Do you know what? If you love something and it keeps on going. Yeah, ultimately you can't fool anybody. You can't stand there looking like a sort of tired old frump. You're either into it or mm. you're not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's yeah. also, it's, it's really interesting what you say about, you know, the phones and, and the fact that, you know, I guess that has sort of shaped the attitudes of, you know, the generation now in their teens and their 20s, because unlike when we were there, as you say, we could do what we wanted. And then there was no worry about unless you physically were stood next to me and kind of saw me at that age, then then that's it. There's no evidence of it now. Whereas I suppose they're just pro programmed whereby anything that happens is then recorded and then posted on social media and exists forever. And that obviously shapes what people do or indeed what they don't do. And how boring what they don't do has become. Thank God phones were, weren't around when we were up to, you know what I mean, going out absolutely. and having fun. Thank absolutely. the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's absolutely true. Right, listen, Jules, let's talk cars because this is mm. loosely a car-based uh, podcast. I mean, it's 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 more about just us sort of blathering about what we've been talking about so far. But let's get on to cars. I know it's a while ago now, but uh, do you remember the momentous day that you passed your test and how many attempts did you have? Um, I passed it first time, and I'm not lying, I did. Um, okay. I do, and I remember that my driving instructor wouldn't allow me to drive home from the test, the theory being that you're in that much of a state of elation. You'd be more likely to crash yeah, yeah. 
at that point than at any other time uh, in the car with your instructor. Well, that makes sense. I get. I mean, I, I'm. I was third time. I, I I messed up twice, but yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, you just got your ticket because it's a, it's a big it's a big rite of passage, isn't it? Yeah, first time it is. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm, probably the first time you feel real freedom. Yeah, I mean, I'm from London, and the, one of the great luxuries then, and to an extent now, I, I know because both one of my one of my kids recently passed their test, is the ability to go to try and pick the driving test centre that is easiest. And in North London, where I'm from, there's a <laughs> real, you know, there's one at or back in the day, I think they think they're still there. There's one at Mill Hill, which involves going up the A1 mm. on a you know a, a six lane road, and then there was one in Burnt yeah. Oak, which involved pottering around a few back streets. And of course, any sane person mm. went for the latter, as I did. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I was, I still find it a bit strange because you know, fast forward 20 odd years when my or more than that in fact when my daughter was doing her test and the same sort of con- um ease of choice you know only a, a no-brain yeah. choice of going to the easiest possible test center um was available it's to th- her that's still a thing mm. yeah that's still a thing then now even even now wow yeah and obviously i mean if you come from somewhere with only one test center if you come from smaller cities or countryside or what have you you don't have that choice um I guess if you come from a smaller city, you've also got less traffic to contend with in your test and arguably less sort yeah, of yeah, things that yeah, might yeah. go wrong. I would imagine, actually, just th- th- thinking about the traffic and the stress, I would imagine passing a test in London is somewhat more difficult than it might be in Derbyshire or Newcastle. Mm. You would just think so, wouldn't you? The, the volume of traffic, and everyone's a bit arsy, aren't they? Mm. Yeah, everyone's just got a bit of attitude in mm. London on the roads. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I mean, I've never taken, you know, never taken my test anywhere else, so I'm, yeah, I can yeah. only speculate. Well, do you know what I did for a magazine for, for a, you know, what, 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 one of the motor racing rags? They said, look, why don't we? Let's see if you if you could pass your test again. <laughs> <laughs> that was a negative, Ghost Rider. Yeah, I'm not sure I Absolutely. could either. I don't think yeah. I could because there's so many things and there's so many sort of bad habits, I guess, that you get into. Yeah. That, that are yeah. just a, an instant, you know, even just the way you hold the wheel, I suppose, is probably an instant. For, I don't mean you personally, Jason, but w- the way that one holds the wheel probably isn't exactly where it should be at 10 to 2. Well, that is a thing, you know, mm. that they want you to feed the wheel. And in my game, that's just not what you do. Yeah, and actually, is. you shouldn't be feeding the wheel anyway. I mean, that's no. re- that's old, old hat. You know, that's yeah. for cars with no power steering and all the rest of it. So, you know, the, the, the driving test should be brought up to the current standard. I personally think that, you know, a few of us, Dave, Judge, some of our other mates, basically everyone that's been on this on this podcast should mm. be allowed to do 120 mile an hour on the motorways at night or more. This is why you're not an MP. I think I'd make a great transport <laughs> minister. <laughs> Jules, everyone what was must it? drive V8. Jules, what was the first <clears throat> car then? Where did the where did the automotive journey begin? <clears throat> well, for you? it was it was quite sad for me, I, I guess, because my mother died when I was eighteen, and I inherited her car, and right. it wasn't the world's best car. It was a Citroen. It was new-ish, but it was certainly in an era when the French reputation for non-existent build quality was uh, was forged. Um, so mm. it you know it was. It meant a lot to me because obviously losing your mother at that age, quite young, not many of yeah, my mates yeah, of had lost a parent, real, really, yeah. real emotional attachment. But on the other hand, the car was utter right. rubbish. It really was broke down. Yeah. Do, you, do, you remember what, do you remember what Citroen it was? It was a Citroen Visa. I do. I mean, Visa's got oh, this kind okay, of international, okay. this international kind of uh, <laughs> feeling about it. But I assure you, it, it wouldn't have got from A to B, let alone to France. <laughs> I remember those actually. Yeah, and I tell so you, you what, what? And, and, and testament to the build quality or lack of it, you don't see any of them now, do you? You know, you don't see any of them no. kicking around in classic uh, in classic shows these days. In fact, the old the old Citroens now are really groovy, aren't they? You know, if you had a you know a DS or so, something mm. now, you'd be pretty cool in one of those. I did briefly Often as well. well I, I think it's a phrase. I briefly had a Citroen Two CV as well, which I mean, in slightly less. Sad circumstances I inherited from my grandmother who lived in Spain. Uh, I mean, she mm. died in her mid mid eighties, so there was no sort of sadness in. And we we drove it over, and it uh, had sort of Malaga number plates, and 
Uh, and I, nice. I had another car at the time, but it was just a bit of a novelty periodically going down to gigs. I had a sort of BMW or something fairly generic at the time, but I went to the occasional yeah, yeah. gig in this Citroen, two, left-hand drive, Citroen 2CV with those <laughs> rolly <laughs> roofs, just for just for the fun of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it blew yeah. around, yeah. You, you know, paper in the wind probably wouldn't have blown around as much as this car, <laughs> but it was, yeah, you don't see, you occasionally see them in Balearic Islands kind of pot- pottering around in the countryside, but they are... Yeah, they've sort of been forgotten about, haven't they? The legendary two CB. Mm. Do you know what? I've got nothing but affection for for them because I had one when I was at college, and it was just the funniest, best thing. I'd put a fiver in; it would like last more than a week or two. Mm. In fact, do you know mm. what I mean? And you know, I think I managed to get mine up to seventy. I think. <laughs> and this um, because my grandmother had had it. I mean, it, had, it was like twenty years old, but it had done like eighteen thousand kilometers. It was like it was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Is the reason, Jason, why you don't see that it's basically has rust knackered most of them? Is that um, why is that why the the few that are still around are probably in hotter climes where they haven't been eaten eaten from the inside? Uh, yeah, I would think so. Do you know what? Paint technology back in those days, yeah, yeah they're just all salt dusty, on the roads, really. But, in know, the Mediterranean, you don't get the yeah, roads yeah. salted. Salt on the roads really bad for course, corrosion, isn't right. it? So, so out of all your cars, that that you, I'm, well, actually, going back to what you said, said earlier about going to gigs, presumably you're not driving yourself; you're being dri- driven. Uh, yes, and I have been for a very long time. But back, yeah. we're going back to an era when I just started, and I did have to drive myself, which was, I suppose, every you know, it's part of cutting your teeth as a DJ. Mm. Absolutely. So, out of all the cars which have been, you know, in your little stable, have you got any faves? Anything where you, you know, the first car you literally got, and you were, oh my God, this is me. No, I mean, my current car, I've, I've got Bentley GTC convertible, well, the convertible, which yeah. is fairly, you know, the new mm. shape one. I've had, this is the fourth GTC I've had. Um, oh and God, I great. absolutely love that. I mean, I'm, I kind of drive sporty cars like a, old man really quite slowly <laughs> but I, I what I love about it and and the, the new generation one is just completely from the ground up uh, reinvention of that particular model whereas the other three were kind of evolutions of the pre-existing model is it's it's got like a sports performance but like an old sort of boat like old man boat like sort of American yeah. style suspension yeah, yeah. and there's not many really many other cars like that particularly convertibles you you know you all the other sort of sporty convertibles of Porsches or or, or all the rest of them really are very got very hard sporty suspension and for some, some people love that but yeah. I, I I just love feeling like an old man sort of floating around in my boat. <laughs> They're great wafty cars with brilliant torquey engines. I mean, yeah. it's a lovely way to travel, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. do you ever, Jules, do you, I mean, when you're, I mean, not all the time, but when you're sort of relocating from, say, Mallorca back to the UK, do you ever drive it? Do you ever sort of do it as a road trip or is, no, or is I mean, I just sort of jump on a plane? And... No, I've got a house with, a, you know, duplicate set of everything there, you know, from decks okay. through to clothes, through to car um, in Mallorca. So no, it's all literally travel with my passport and a backpack, which is a, quite a luxury. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just saying because, you know, of all the kind of, because that, that is a nice bit of kit for doing kind of nice sort of continental motoring, isn't it? You know, wafting along through France on lovely kind of smooth roads. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a nice thing to be in. Yeah, I guess the only the only fear is in certain parts of the world and parts of Europe, in fact, that somebody's scratching up your car or what have you. The mm. only thing about, I mean, I do have another car, but I, in, in the case of that car, I tend to take it where I think it's, sensible places to take yeah, it i mean it is my everyday yeah, car i yeah. drive it every day into my office my legal practice yeah. office but um at the same time i wouldn't necessarily take it in the, under all circumstances which is it, it's the way it is isn't it and the other thing if you're doing a trip from spain up the way through through france you're gonna get nicked in that aren't you because you you know you know what the roads are like they're fantastic to get yeah. your toe down aren't they yeah absolutely and the other thing is that you know the french aren't known for looking after cars as you say if you end up kind of in somewhere that's quite busy because it's funny though isn't it because actually as a huge generalization coming up here but you know unlike other european countries like the italians or the germans um you know who who have a real pride in their cars the french as a general rule, see them as functional transport, which is why yeah. when you're in somewhere like Paris or you're in somewhere like Marseille, you see these beaten up little tin cans because they are they 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 they, they park and they nudge up against other cars, and it's it's a functional thing, isn't it? Rather than something that's to be looked after and cherished. Yeah. Also, motorway driving is a is a 
thing to behold when you drive in in France. Notwithstanding the fact that the police are not too fond of British drivers, and whereas perhaps no. if you were in, <laughs> if perhaps if you were pulled over for speeding in Spain by uh, and you had a British number plate and a British driving license, number they might plate. tell you to be naughty and wave you off. In France, that ain't going to happen. That you're going to get fined, and it and that road down from. Yeah. Um, from Calais to, to Paris and beyond is notorious mm. for, for speed traps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and you know, if you get nicked and you haven't got cash, they escort you to the cash point because mm. they're kind ready. Mm. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also, if you're in Paris, the, the the golden rule is never put your handbrake on and leave it out of gear because you're gonna get it's gonna get bumped around. Yeah, isn't it? Because people just bump, bump to get into gas. Absolutely, yeah. So you're better off, you know, allowing it to yeah. move, aren't you? Because otherwise, yeah. you know, if you've got your handbrake on, you're just going to get the front or the back end dented, which is is yeah. is tough. Um, where are you on electric cars, Jules? Is it something that you've ever? Um, yeah, I've got you know, one. I've been got down one. the electric route. I've okay. got one. I've got a BMW iX four by four, which. Um, I got on a lease actually quite recently and the pr- lease prices have gone down ridiculously compared to, it was probably 50% cheaper to lease than it would have been a year earlier, which is indicative really? of the lease of the, uh, of the problems yeah. faced by ele- the electric car markets. Um, yeah. And for all the reasons, I mean, it's well publicized, but for the record, we all know why electric cars aren't doing as well as they should do. Like Blake pretty much lying about range Um Mm. The <laughs> paucity, even in London, a paucity of fast charging, let alone outside this this country. Um, the uncertainty regarding resale prices, the uncertainty about long term battery life. But I get, but I've got a lease. It's mm. for for a couple of years. It's a great car. Absolutely love it, and I can charge it outside my house. But if you don't have the ability to charge your electric car outside your house which the majority of people probably don't certainly in london mm, yeah. it's mm. there are significant disadvantages and i uh yeah. i've a friend of mine very close friend of mine has actually got one of the most senior jobs in the british motoring industry and he so i get some intel about that and you're probably aware that the government on the one hand the government extended the deadline um before which um before which uh, petrol and diesel engines can no longer be sold to 2035. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah, imposing yeah. a penalty yeah, yeah. Uh, on, I think, I think they a penalty on the the sales of the self same vehicles that is completely unrealistic. Yeah. So that so the motor industry is sort of stuck up shit creek without a paddle really when it comes to this mm, situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, Electric cars are fabulous. I, you know, having, you know, my two cars are a bit of a petrol guzzler and an electric car. So, and I can only speak really positively about the quality of the car, but it doesn't go far enough if you wanted to actually do any journey of substance. Couldn't use it to go out DJing because you can't, A, the range isn't good enough unless you go at 60 miles an hour on the motorway. Can't guarantee that we'll be charging at the other end. Um, So it's a, it's a little bit unfair on the motor industry to hold them to account when the infrastructure mm. is not there and nor is the technology. And we keep hearing about the, you know, the, I don't know, the golden, the golden ticket of a car with a thousand, eight hundred, a thousand mile range on a charge, but that's a long way off, isn't it? And that, re- uh, but something yeah. far in excess of what we have now, let's say double at least what we have now in the, I mean, the, yeah, the yeah, longest yeah. range yeah. electric vehicles probably have about 350 range even then that's a bit of a fit depends on the variable yeah depends on the variables yeah um but you need you really need double that before i mean there are many many people who charge up and down the motorway for whatever reason every day doing long distance journeys and it's just it's unworkable so it's we all agree that it's a great Mm. thing in theory but the practical reality Mm. is unless you're using it like i do for short you know, relatively short journeys and I can stick it outside the house and put it on charge, which is a luxury that I have and yeah. not many others do. It's not going to mm. work yeah. really in the short term no, anyway. I, I agree. And unless the, you know, the, the current battery technology we've got, there needs to be a step change, almost like a new technology that they discover to get the energy de- de- density to make them do six, seven, eight hundred miles, which they need to do. Yeah, Otherwise, absolutely. we won't be able to, you know, we, there won't be mass adoption. Yeah, and the the one thing that the biggest factor, of, having spoken to a bunch of friends before I actually taking delivery of the electric car that I've got, in determining battery life, 
is motorway driving and speed. And if you go at 60, mm. which is, let's face it, you're going to get hooted and kind of flashed by people if you go at 60 on many yeah. motorways. <laughs> yeah. You're you're actually going to gain so about twenty. Like yeah, you're going to gain about twenty five percent of uh, of range, um, but surely that defeats the object. You know what we're going to go do? Go back to the horse and cart, but meanwhile have a really sensible radius available to us. Yeah, and this uh, do you know what? And this is a it's a conversation that we we have a lot on on this uh, on this podcast with various different people, and I think everybody you know pretty much universally, Jason, don't they? We you know we all come to this this same conclusion, whereby, as you've rightly said, you know they're a wonderful they're a wonderful invention, and yes, of course they are the future, and they're the future of a of a healthy and greener planet. But until the infrastructure is made certainly on a par with what we have at the moment with uh, combustion engines, it's just not feasible. I mean, I've, I've never owned one, but I can't imagine that sort of sense of panic. I mean, you know, I have a sense of panic sometimes when you run a, a bit low on petrol and you're kind of thinking, God, it's saying I've only got 20 miles and I don't know where the nearest thing is. But, you know, if you, when you've got that on a charge and you've got no idea where the next proper charge point is or indeed how long it's going to take, I mean, you can't relax and travel around the country under those circumstances. Yeah, and the shame is, I mean, the car, the one, I, what I've got, which is this BMW four by four, it goes like a rocket. I, it, it's it's yeah. the tech, the tech is incredible, the 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 performance is incredible, the road holding is fabulous, the looks are good, but it's just missing these key ingredients. Do you know what I tested? Um, what was it about eighteen m- m- months ago? We went over to to, to Norway because that's kind of like the capital of EVs, electric vehicles, mm-hmm. and. Um, we tested a new technology, new technology by a company called Neo, and they had a system where on their sat nav you'd say, right, I, want, I need some charge, I need a back battery, and you select on there, and it goes, oh, do you want a new battery? And you go, oh yeah, I love that. Mm. So then you drive up, you park the car on this in, in this in this blue box, you take your hands off the wheel, and then the car then automatically reverses in, gets lifted up, all by robots, new battery in. Mm five mi- mi- minutes in and out that's what you want yeah but anyway they've got no plans to it's th- that technology is in china now and they're rolling out in europe but they're not planning to come to the uk well the infrastructure i mean that's a whole different kind of infrastructure that's required isn't it um similar to hydrogen yeah i mean there'd be many people who theorize that actually the future is hydrogen cars which are the, the greenest of all because of course the production of batteries of lithium batteries is hugely environmentally damaging mm. yeah. Um, and mm. and you're running most electricity is generated in this country uh, non environmentally friend in a non environmentally friendly fashion. We don't have much nuclear power in this country. Whereas hydrogen, you know, you're spurting out a bit of water. Um, the t- the technology's yeah, there, yeah. but again, the infrastructure. I mean, it's by far the greenest form of um, technology. And of course, you can refill vehicles with hydrogen very quickly. So the range issue is eliminated. But the just but the infrastructure and the technology uh, the the on mass technology is not is way behind why is that jason in terms of the fact that you know why haven't why haven't you know governments and and populations as a whole why haven't they got behind the hydrogen thing and sort of backed that as almost the option of choice going forward what what's what are the downsides do you know what i think it's a little bit like betamax and vhs Really, in in a, in, a, in a really kind of, I mean, I, I know that's a strange analogy, but I think it is like that. You know, there's, you know, the electric way is a bit easier because we've all had electric m- motors. Mm. For in fact, the first ever car was an electric car, first right. ever car in America. So yeah, you know, electric m- motors have been around for years, but hydrogen powered cells have not been, and it just was a technology which has, you know, we've we, we've gone down the VHS route rather than mm. the Betamax. Mm. Which we all know is a be- was a better pro- product than VHS. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Jules, let's let's Jules, let's go back to uh, some of the earlier cars. We've I think we've I think we've done electric now, and I think we're people are very clear on our on our general opinions. <laughs> back to the early days, uh, young Judge Jules, bit of money in his pocket, likes to spend something on you know something a bit bit flash you know what are some of the early cars from your 20s let's say well the first new car i bought was a golf gti convertible which is the sort of classic shape nice. gti convertible in the yeah. late 80s which um was was a sort of iconic i don't know I, I, iconic city boy car even though i've never been a city boy i've always been a dj um mm. and it was 
I was so, I, I mean, I remember the day I bought it, I was that proud, but it didn't have power yeah. steering and it was yeah. a ridiculously heavy car. Didn't have yeah. none of these sort of electri- electrical sort of accoutrements that you, you associate with modern cars. Yeah. Didn't have a power hood, didn't have, it, it, it did have electric, it <laughs> didn't have rear electric windows. It was just so dated yeah. by compar- comparisons to now, but it was still the car of the 80s, if you like, albeit the very late yeah, yeah. 80s. Into, it might have been the very early 90s, actually, when I got it. I was going to say, there's that and the Peugeot 205. They, they were the iconic. Mm. Um, they were. Hatches. I think I think the Golf, yeah, the Golf, yeah. I think, was, dare I say it, well, equally iconic, but probably one notch above the, the Peugeot in oh, terms of engineering yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and build quality oh, and what long. have you. Yeah. But that, it, that was the last yeah, vehicle I ever had without power steering. And I can tell mm. you, I mean, how anybody, you know, I was a robust, <laughs> I was a robust kid in his early 20s. But how anybody who was a bit, you know, a smaller person could possibly have driven it. We take these sort of things so for granted now, don't we? We forget that tech yeah. is a, I mean, I really struggle with, with, with cars over it from prior to about 2010. 2010 is when tech, all the important tech bits were in cars, you know, having either having USB or having Bluetooth. Even before 2010 mm. or thereabouts, you couldn't Bluetooth your music into a car. And that's, yeah, you know, for me as a DJ, insane, that's absolutely it? essential, <laughs> notwithstanding having something that sounds pretty good. But it's, it's right. weird, isn't it? When you do, as you say, we've all got so used to the fact that um, power steering is just standard on everything now, is that when you do ever get back into an old car, as you say, it's amazing how heavy they were. And this was just the norm and sort of almost like wrestling with the with the steering wheel. You know, you couldn't sort of drive around as we do now and just sort of flicking it with a finger and stuff like that. It's incredibly heavy. Well, that's why the driving, what, what we, which they teach you, is so yeah. wrong. All this speed mm. in the wheel, because you needed to do that yeah. back in the old days. Now yeah. you don't. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Hey, so here's a question, uh, Jules. Um, obviously, being into music, car hi-fi back in the eighties, nineties, it was something which, if you wanted good sounds, you had to put it in yourself you, or you get certainly a did. To rip out the stand. So, so come on. Did, did, did you ever have a Nakamishi tape deck? Because that was the, <laughs> the most amazing tape deck in the world. I didn't. No, I had what I like was it? A Blau Blau Punk. I had a Blau, I had Blau Punk. A Blau Blau Punk was the thing, yeah, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, nice. Um, I did. I did yeah, have yeah, a couple yeah. of my cars. I did sort of add add some stereo stuff into, and then sort of later on, did you? Good just life. got into the era where they were beginning to put much better sound systems in and now i mean the car my current mm, yeah. main car my gtc has just got it's got subwoofers it's got but it's all a standard yeah. it's the the, the bar yeah. has been and the bmw ix has got a really good sound system in it as well yeah the yeah. i mean it's i have a real problem as a dj as somebody who's lived my life with music i have a real problem listening to if anybody plays me a track on their phone you know straight out the phone speaker it's like mm. it's like metal tip fingers down a blackboard i find it absolutely horrific yeah. so but i think the standard yeah. of yeah. Uh, of the the early cars that sound systems that i probably had would be no better than that they were just terrible weren't they and you, mm. you yeah. just took that for mm. granted I don't, I don't. Yeah, I was going to say, a lot, a lot of the guests we've all, all had, we all remember cutting the rear parcel shelf out and putting a pair of six by nines in there and, you know, all that sort, sort of stuff. Because the sounds were, they, they were crap, weren't I they? I created a box, actually, and did the same thing, a sort of a, a, an open, did you? A, a sort of open bottomed box in which I, I painted right. it black, stuck two huge speakers in there and wired that in because I didn't <laughs> want to chop into my car when I resold it. Brilliant. And that was your sub in the boot. Well, it was not in the, it was sort of on the part of the rear parcel shelf. And it was, okay. Yeah. It was loud, baby. It was loud. <laughs> you know, talking, talking, talking about putting uh, different stereos and stuff. I just sort of had a, had a flashback to the fact that I too had an early Golf GTI. It was a Mark II. It was a 1992 black one with the BBS wheels, a sort of classic, classic shape. And, um, and it used to have the front of the, the front of the stereo used to come off. Do you remember those things where, and yeah, it, even, it even, it even had like a little special case that you would put. Well, it was to stop people there. stealing stereos. Yeah. 
Absolutely. It? Yeah. Yeah, 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 it was. It was. But rather than because there was also the stereos that you could remove the whole thing, they, they came, yeah, they came on a sort yeah. of like a handle. And if you were going yeah. into the pub, you could walk in with your stereo <laughs> with a little <laughs> handle, isn't you know. It mental. We but isn't it when you that. when you think back to it now the fact that you know you you'd walk into the pub with you and put your stereo on the bar or on the table <laughs> while you had a pint so that some yeah. you know someone wouldn't some half inch out of the car park yeah. Yeah. yeah it was because i suppose that was a product of the fact that the inbuilt um manufacturer provided stereos were so terrible that everybody who was into yeah. music wanted to replace it with something better whereas now you know the bog standard tends to be acceptable at the very least oh, yeah so, Jules, we we always believe that music and cars, it's a match made in heaven. It goes particularly well together. So, so just imagine it's your fantasy drive. You, you can choose any car. You know, where are you? Where are you going? What are you listening to? But most importantly, what are you in? I mean, I, I genuinely have my dream car. Um, uh, mm. I, I suppose, I suppose, if you wanted to go one up on a quite unrealistic level you get one of the rolls royce convertibles but i just think rolls royce a little bit too flashy but i you know from a fantasy perspective let's go rolls royce convertible driving down the Mm -hmm. driving down the highway north of malibu going up uh by the pacific at sunset um coming out of los angeles which you wouldn't be doing very quickly because the traffic there is so bad um heading eventually (laughs) up to the sort of towards northern california and Mm. i'm I mean, I guess for me, there's there's no middle ground. Either it's uh, chill, it, sort of Café Del Mar stroke ch- st- style of chill out albums or film yeah, scores yeah. Um, for that kind of, but that's more a kind of daytime Balearic Mediterranean moment. Or it's just make it absolutely mm. banging. But you need crystal clear <laughs> sound. Uh, you want 140 BPM, yeah. crystal clear sound, uh, the severe <laughs> risk of annoying everybody and looking like a complete knob. That's the way we go <laughs> forward. Yeah. Mate, 140 B- BPM, there's a high chance I'd be off the road, I reckon. I, I get too so. excited. I think <laughs> so. You'd be, you'd be taking a left straight into the drink, wouldn't you, on that road out of, yeah. uh, out of Los yeah. Angeles? And I'll tell you what, and then, and then I think that, that maybe Jason and I should plot a little route and we should meet you somewhere for a sundown or somewhere on that road. There's got to be a nice little bar with a, with a sea view. We could sit there with a couple of gin and tonics and all ready for your arrival. And I think on that note, Jason, and that beautiful image, I think you need to take us out. He's not said yes yet. Oh, <laughs> it's a yes. Oh, no, we, we need some commitment first before we're going out. <laughs> <laughs> he's nodded, he's nodded. It's, it's a yes. We'll say, we'll say <laughs> yeah. it's a yes. It's a yes. Right, well, with a yes to a fantastic meet-up from Jules, that is it for this week's Fueling Around, powered by Adrian Flux. As UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Dave, as always, thanks to you, but a huge thanks to our special guest this week, the one and only Judge Jules. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed. And I'll see you in the, really? sunset, in the sunset in our respective vehicles. We- Absolutely. We'll get it. We'll get a couple of cocktails on the go and some fancy umbrellas and it will be all proper Del Boy, but we'll be there with, with bells on it. Uh, don't forget, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at Jason Plato or at David Vitti. And if you'd like what you've heard, feel free to give us a five star rating, press the follow button and share the podcast on all your socials. Thanks for listening, everybody. And we'll see you next time. I'm now off on the Internet to try and find myself a fantastic old Mustang. Mustang.